Now, quick, I always like to know the audience. So really quick, just to real quick, hold your hand up if you're a banker. Keep your hand up if you're happy. Okay. Hold your hand up if you're a farmer. All right, keep your hand up if you're happy. All right, well, pretty good, okay. So another question I'd like to start with, how many in the room would like to own more farmland? My hand's up on this one, right? So farmland is a really unique asset class. It represents 83% of the assets in the sector, $3 trillion now in the US, 2.5 trillion of it in farmland, 83% of that in Illinois, 245, excuse me, billion. We can do the math, right? The question though is where it's headed and should we be buying more or selling more? And how many of you want to sell farmland? I should have asked that question. Maybe there's a market made here. Uh, but we want to talk about this in a fairly conceptual way at first and go through some of the big issues, headwinds, tailwinds, and then prospects for the future. Like the other uh, speakers have pointed out, a lot has changed in the last couple of weeks in particular with respect to interest rates. And so some of the slides I've substituted and updated and put in a few more things. Mostly you'll see what's in the book, but there are a few extra things in it. So, but usually you can think about the value of an asset with just a few major issues. How much income does it generate? What does it cost, the cost of capital to buy that? And what is the likely change in the future of income to that asset class? And if we start with that general framework, we can look kind of at some major uh, kind of topics and, and big factors that are influencing each of those and figure out what direction we might think it would head in the future. So in the headwind section, we're gonna talk about declining farm incomes. I was supposed to be the uh, cheerful last speaker too and get everybody's spirits back up and mostly the uh, uh, conversations have been, well, you know, prices are low and getting lower and incomes are low and getting lower and uh, I'm, I'm going to have some rosy things at the end. Also, we have uh, experienced, a, you know, rather, um, you know, if you look at the Twitter space as the place where we adjudicate questions about uh, public policy now, we've had a really volatile week on interest rate markets. That's been important. And there's still a lot of remaining uncertainty about the tariff and the situation with trade. We want to talk about that, but with some I think fairly powerful data behind that to put it in perspective. It's not an easy thing to figure out what happens when China retaliates. What does that do to the price of Illinois farmland? I want to try to create some linkages there. And then on the tailwinds, have some other things too. So first though, this is a picture you're all familiar with. It's a picture everyone's experienced. But it's important to put it in context. We've only had one period of time, really, other than the last three years in the history of farm, modern farm, modern agriculture where farmland has decreased in value. And that was in the 80s. In the farm crisis in the 80s, the percentage reduction was in many parts of the Midwest, 25 to 50%. Okay, recently though, we've gone very high, uh, last few years up through about 2013 and 14, rapid increase in asset values again. And then the last three years, we've backed off 10 to 15% in most markets, sometimes a little more, a little less. But what's important here is to look at this in the picture, in the context of what we expect going forward. And for most of the markets we follow, um, I have a, a system now where we follow about 250 auction websites. And we follow, um, because of the calculations we do in the state of Illinois, we actually get the Department of Revenue sales data back and we get every single transaction for farmland in the, US, in the state of Illinois. And we follow it in Iowa. It looks like things are kind of stable right now. So I know there are a lot of no sales and some things are up or down, but we've kind of put in a soft bottom in the uh, farmland market. And we want to think about where that's likely to go going forward. Uh, Illinois, uh, again, this is a USDA series. And so it, the number will be a lot lower than you would experience right around this part of the world where the production is much higher and the soil qualities are higher than the average in the state. But most importantly, you could replace this axis here with bushels per acre and the picture would look the same. So farmland is really worth what it can produce. And so if we think of that as being the indicator of what expected income in the future is, it works out really well. Now, again, I know that's a big change in thinking to some degree, but for that scale, just say, we want to look at the expected income going forward. And what happened is we had very high interest rates and some loan problems, frankly. A grain embargoes, other things that changed, as Scott pointed out, the demand. We had a long expansionary period and now it looks like people expect that the long-term income might be going up. So way to think about it. This is a very complicated, uh, simple, complicated, simple chart. Across the top, your cost of capital. If you think I have to earn 4% owning farmland, 
I have to earn 4% from all forms. You know, um, the joy of owning it might be worth 2%. Uh, the headache of owning it might be minus 3%. I don't know. But the total cost of capital, if you will, across the top, and how much expected return you expect in the long run per acre, and the growth rate in that. I'm personally fairly optimistic that incomes to agriculture are growing up. In the long run, I don't expect them to go down further, not for a long period of time, not in a uh, permanent sense. So I'm putting in a 1% projected growth rate in income. So take a look at if you could earn $300, you expect it to grow at 1% a year on average, and your cost of capital were 4%, you could pay $10,000 for that acre farmland. Gross oversimplification, I understand. But that's just an easy way to think about the relationship of the things that we're going to talk about for the next uh, two and a half hours. Uh, man, tough crowd. Just to see what we can say influences the top row or the cost of capital, the vertical axis or the rate of return, and whether we expect that to grow or decline in the future. So first of all, what's happened to the cost structure behind this? This is really hard to um, like ignore. But the input cost structure, and this is a very commonly used graph. This is one the USD updates every year. Uh, seed cost or input cost related to the genetics have really skyrocketed. Uh, so the basic rule of thumb is if a, a seed corn uh, can grow one more bushel, they can charge you the value of what? One more bushel. No, they can charge you about 60% of that increase in production just for that input. So the cost of seed has gone up, but that's because the genetics are really good now. You can grow things all the way up in North Dakota that you couldn't a long time ago. So the seed costs have gone way up. Fertilizer costs very much follow energy costs to some degree. Land and rental rates. That's the one that's kind of tapered off and become much more stable again. So I don't expect those to change much. And if they do change, it doesn't look like they're going to really shrink, except that some energy cost exposure could be good going forward that are things related to natural gas and such, or maybe not. There is some active management of what genetics you use. And you need triple stacks, six stacks. And there's a lot of management of populations that are getting better. But in general, this is the pattern. This is what we see. So the overall costs look like they've increased. And yet the price of corn, as you see, quite down. So income. Again, I won't spend much time on this because I really want to look out into the future. My job was to run toward the horizon. So Scott got the assignment of telling everybody the price of corn while he wasn't at the meeting. He's telling the truth on that. And I was sort of asked to say, what's over the horizon? So, uh, so this, I want to think about the things that influence this going forward. Okay, this in, is not in your uh, graph, or this is not in your book, but I think it's really important and it tells a really cool story. So again, to orient you, this is the yield curve from August 2001 to earlier this week. And this front line right here is the yield curve the day before the Federal Open Market Committee met. This is the yield on treasuries, the vertical axis. This sort of front of the two front axes is from 2001 until earlier this week. And then on this axis, it's one month, three months, six months, out to 30 years. So this front line is what you would normally look at and say, that's the yield curve. For orientation, looking forward, if we were to just plot the one-year and the 10-year rate through time, we would have gotten two spots on that yield curve. We would have gotten the spot that was at the one-year point through time and the 10-year point through time. Now, why this is important, though, is that at the moment of the financial crisis, clear back in 2008, can you believe it's been a whole decade now? One of my favorite days of my life, I got to be at Lehman Brothers the day they declared bankruptcy. Now, that's only interesting to an economist, I realize, but it was a pretty cool day. <laughs> I didn't own any Lehman stock. Um, so September 19, 2008, the short-term market shut down, and we went into a decade where we didn't have a yield curve. Short-term interest rates were zero. What could you borrow a 30-year farm mortgage for five years ago? That's amazingly cheap money. By historic perspectives, that was amazingly cheap money. And yet, as a sector, we didn't lever up because we had good incomes. Now, during that period of time, also, it's important. This may sound like really boring econo speak um, because it is. But we had several interventions by the Federal Reserve. We had TARP, TALF, uh, Troubled Asset Relief Program, Liquidity Facility. And then Q I'm looking kind of at the wrinkles at the back end of the yield curve so I know where they started and stopped. QE1, QE2, and Operation Buyback began there. And the Fed's balance sheet went from nothing other than liquidity to adding $1.7 trillion. It's a giant number now. And then we're just now beginning to let those assets roll off and get back into a period where we have what you could think of as a normal yield curve. 
that influences the cost of owning a farm asset. We're now back into the real world. We spent a decade, try teaching, so I, I teach a couple of finance classes at the U of I, try teaching time value of money to 18-year-olds who've never seen a positive interest rate in their life in a savings account. Uh, but this is also important because the financial sector doubled the amount of capital they had behind assets during that same period. Okay, so just think about that. And now look at the rate hikes the Federal Open Market Committee has made since 2008. They're all right there. They're all right there. We've only started changing and letting assets be exposed to world demand for money in the last two years. Now, was it a surprise when the interest rates were raised, the short-term rates were raised? No. Did it have an effect on anything? None whatsoever. 10-year rates were 279, and at the end of the day, they were 279. So interest rates that matter, there was not a shock. It wasn't a surprise what the Fed did, but it still puts agricultural assets now at risk for changes in the cap rate that I think didn't really happen for the last decade or so. This is somewhat important. In which direction do you think interest rates are going in general? How many of you think they're going to plummet? <laughs> not many. Okay, so this is just the same data, but if you look at the long term, that's the, this is exactly the same data from the previous chart, but just capturing the 10-year and the one-year rate. So back around the dot-com, we got to a very flat yield curve, then we went to the zeros to 10-year. And if you take that red box and put it out here, what do you see? What you see is not great news for banks on the yield side because we have a very flat yield curve. So the ability to borrow money from, from you as depositors on CDs and lend it back to you as farmers at a longer duration doesn't create as much of a gap. So it's a little harder for banks to make money on that. But the demand for loans is really strong. So it doesn't, it's not completely clear to me which direction that heads. You can still borrow five-year money at just over 5%. In 10-year money, you heard five and a half to six per head. So it's still not very expensive. But what has changed is the risk cost. So this is, again, a chart. Uh, we have a, a nice little copy of a loan from uh, 1983, I think, um, which was a 40% or 40-year amortization, 80% loan at 15% interest rate. Imagine taking that loan out now. Well, that just didn't happen in the last few years, we have much lower interest rates, much lower leverage in the farm community in total. Uh, different lending environment in that we used to only have about a 165, 165 basis points for administration and risk. And now across all lenders, this is uh, Federal Reserve data, about 2.5. And we're beginning to figure out how to lend to non-owners as though it's a financial asset rather than an owned uh, operating asset. So more headwinds, the tariffs, I want to talk about that a little bit more. Farm policy, we heard all the updates today, but another thing that's happening is farm policy is sort of evolving away from direct commodity support toward things that are either crop insurance, sustainability motivated, or consumer food sort of issues are being reflected increasingly, at least in the people who can support the people who pass a farm bill. So it's becoming a little further distance between the farm coalition and the motivations of the people who actually write the farm bill. Uh, and then changes in consumer demand. I'm not sure if this is a headwind or a tailwind, but the, the regulatory environment is probably not going to get easier. The ability to trace and locate the causes of things like uh, the romaine lettuce problems and other issues, that will become increasingly important. The flip side of that is, though, the consumers are beginning to express demand for attributes. You've perhaps seen the TV show Portlandia, where they want to know if the chicken was happy before they <laughs> ordered on the menu. This, this idea, though, that a consumer can actually express a demand for an attribute that can be transmitted all the way back to create a price signal at the farm, that's actually beginning to really happen. Uh, the berry markets with Driscoll as a conduit is one of the examples where there's some great examples for that. So I want to talk about a couple of these. Um, Fairly rapid fire. And on this slide, I want to just talk about why um, what you saw from China actually makes complete sense to me. If you look at, and uh, President Trump likes to talk a lot about the trade deficit and the difference between what we import and what we export, um, you know, that difference is why you can buy a 70 inch TV for $1,000. If it were the same, it would cost a lot more, but it's unclear what the distribution of those different payments would be. And if you want to say, for the things that China sells us, we want to put some form of a, a extra burden on that, what should China do? 
Well, that's all of the trade. Agriculture is the only category I can find where the exports are greater than the imports. The only major category, at least the ones that we care about in here. So if I were China, where would I actually concentrate my response? Right there in that orange box. So what is that? Oh, it's agricultural. Okay. A couple other important changes. And these slides were, um, uh, somebody from Farmer Mac helped put these together. Uh, fantastic presentation in my mind to summarize complicated stuff very quickly. Where did we used to sell things to? Well, Japan, of course. So from 1980 to roughly present, can't tell to the end of every year, then it takes a while to tabulate. China, uh, Netherlands as the import port for Europe, Mexico were the primary locations. Now it's Canada, China, and Mexico. So if you wonder where we should negotiate uh, bilateral trade uh, relationships, those three now top destinations might be natural candidates. If you were to say, what did we use to export? It used to be corn, followed by wheat, followed by soybeans. Now what do we export? Soybeans. Wait, what else? That's all. So soybeans have become the incre incredibly important export. Where to? China. I'm, I'm oversimplifying. I just want to point out the major factors that are going to influence one of those three dimensions on what you can pay for farmland and how it influences the expectation of income going forward. I really like this one, though, because you can put it then into a context with where we sit. If you take the U.S. and divide it up into square miles, and every square mile is represented by a hex of a proportional size, you can rearrange them to look roughly like the states. But if you looked at it in terms of the value of agricultural outputs, in particular those that are exported, you see where does it matter? Well, remember where the U.S. would have voted on this picture, red and blue? Where does the red and blue land here? And can you think about why it would make sense to also put retaliatory tariffs onto something that might be centered in the U.S. as well. And Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa, and California are really, really important if you look at the value of the agricultural production. Okay? So that, that, to me, is a very significant distinction to make relative to total land mass, uh, total land mass or number of states, two senators per state. If you look at it this way, you can see why we should care a little bit more here. Uh, go th really quickly through this one. A lot of folks will, and myself included, my initial reaction was, well, why don't we just sell to whoever Brazil sold to? And Brazil can sell to China. Well, it's a lot harder than that. It's one, really hard, as Todd has made the point, it's really hard to rearrange shipping contracts. It's also really hard to rearrange patterns of where things come from and go to. It's also really hard to take soybeans, put them into a, a non-domestic market with different ownership without a lot of extra planning. So, Again, this is just the impact by location. It's really hard to replace China as a source. And I like this picture. It's like map of the market. If you were to put everything into a proportional uh, footprint, how much of it's soybeans, uh, it's really, really heavily weighted toward places in the U.S. where soybeans are grown. So, again, I know this is start starting to be reversed and the agreements for the next three months. We'll see how much of this we get out of. Um, Predicting federal policy right now is not an easy game, I recognize. Um, but I also think that one of the problems is that I've begun actually really internalizing this idea. I think the half-life of a trade war is about twice as long as the event itself. So even if we get out of the trade war with China in the next year, it'll take a couple of years to get halfway back to the demand export maybe four years to get three-fourths of the way back and so on. It just, it's a very slow rearrangement. So I don't think you heal really quickly from those kinds of wounds. This is another picture where if you said, where does it matter? Soybeans that went west through the rail system to the port suffered a lot more impact on price than soybeans that went south. Um, and again, this is just roughly $1.65. I wonder how they came up with the number for the market transition payments. Uh, tailwinds, though. It's not all bad news. That was, that was as much bad news as I could actually come up with, frankly. So I want to give you a really quick 4,000-word summary of the world. There are four pictures here that are just laid out flat patterns of the, US, or of the world. Top left is where do people live. Now, do you notice there's no date on this? You don't need a date on this graph. You only need a scale. When there were 3 billion people in the world, this is what it looked like. When there were 6 billion, this is what it looked like. When there will be 9.6 billion, as FAO has sort of projected out through, this is what the world looks like. Okay? Where are people? There are a few people in the U.S., but they're mainly on the coast. A few people in South America, mainly on the coast. 
few people, quite a few people in Europe, but all the way through to the Fertile Crescent, a few people in Northern Africa, and then everybody who lives in Pakistan, India, China, uh, Indonesia, and south, other areas of Southeast Asia, that's where people live. Double the population of the world, that's where people will still live. You don't need a scale on that. Or, I'm sorry, you don't need a date on that. You only need a scale. And you know, the economist creed, by the way, is if you give a number, don't give a date. If you give a date, don't give a number. And if you happen to be right, don't act surprised. So, so number two, where does rain fall? And rainfall, the sweet spot is this middle color that's kind of the light green. Right where it goes from yellow to green, that's about 35 to 36 inches. So in the middle of the US, we have a nice area in the major producing areas of Brazil. Shockingly, quite a bit in South Africa that's good. And a lot through Eastern Europe and around again to the Fertile Crescent. But that's not really going to move much. Under the most extreme versions of climate change, uh, it moves north and south a bit and becomes more variable. But frankly, the total inches don't change all that much. Next one, where are the soils that exist? And again, how many of you think these are this needs a date? This is not moving much. You can change soil quality in a location a little bit, but you can't change where the glaciers came twice uh, epochs ago. So this not light green color is the sweet spot. And you're sitting on top of the best topsoil in the world. So there's some there, some there, some there, a little bit right there. And little, but they don't overlap with the other perfects very well. So these three slides don't actually need a date. What does need a date is this one, where incomes occur. And this is GDP per square mile. And the US is incredibly rich. If I gave everybody in the room another, a dollar bill on the way out, what would you do differently with your diet today? The answer is nothing. If I gave everybody in Pakistan an extra dollar on the way out of the room, some would change what they ate that day. Okay? Now, when you change from not having enough money to eat whatever you want to having enough money to eat what all you want, a couple of things happen. I'm going to go out of order here just for a second. This scale is shockingly stable through time as well. If you think about GDP and the amount of animal protein you eat or the amount of total calories you consume, it's a different curve, but it's very stable. The, the richer you get to some point, the more you substitute toward other forms of calories. And I'll explain that differently in a second. But I want to go back to where people are and where they're getting richer. The slide on the left, this one is very critical to understand. The horizontal axis is fraction of the world's population. So from 50 to 70 would be 20% of the world's population. China has roughly a little more than that, actually. And the height is how much money per person you have converted to dollar bills. Therefore, the size of the block represents the economic power or the economic capacity of that engine. The US, of course, very rich, very skinny in population, and not growing much. China, very fat and growing at 6.5 to 6.6 percent per year. We might grow in the US two, two and a quarter this year, maybe. Uh, very unclear if we keep track of that in the same way even. And then who's growing fastest out of the major regions of the world that can grow? The red line is China. So it's growing the fastest and it's the biggest width. So when that bar gets this big, it'll be four times as big as the US in terms of economic capacity. Now back to, and what do you do when you get more money? You eat more protein. So if you have to only eat corn-based items, you eat a calorie out of corn and you get a calorie back. If you feed it to a chicken first, you have to feed the chicken two calories to get a calorie back. If you feed it to pork, you have to maybe do nine, ten calories. And if you want to consume dairy over the long run, it's even more. So as we move toward the consumption of higher quality proteins, you have to scale up the number of calories you have to grow in corn and soybeans. So that's really positive news over the very long run. Now, can we keep up with the supply faster than other parts of the world? Unclear. So here's the way I think about it, though. And this is very abstract, very econo uh, speak. But if you take, think about taking the globe and all dollars that exist, convert every economic transaction to a dollar equivalent so you don't have to use multiple currencies, and then put a static charge on each dollar bill, and then back away and let them collect. Where would the center of the world's economic activity exist? So put everything weighted by its location, and say, given all of those same static charges, where would the center weighted of all the dollars of trade and activity happen? 
Well, it began where civilization began, sort of Ottoman Empire through, moored toward Europe. Never gets to the U.S. continent, by the way. So jumps over to the 1950s, and then when the U.S. was essentially half the world, it still was somewhere between Europe and U.S. And as you go through the 60s and 90s and 2000, uh-oh, this is pretty interesting for two reasons. Accelerating back toward the population centers that now have money, and the gap between years is getting longer. So from 1990 to 2000, moving back that direction, 2000 to 2010, that far to 25. So the center of the economic world becomes where most people have the most money. You can think of, and again, this is very econo-something-ish, you can think of all transactions as being a weighted distance of where things happen to that dot. Some of it has to be done with transportation and trade, so we have to send our corn somewhere. Increasingly, we have to send it toward that dot. Whether we send it in you know, uncrushed beans or in ethanol or in uh, batteries that can capture other, there's ways of converting its form, but this is where the economic center of the, of the world will end up being. And I think that's fairly positive for the demand for agricultural products, frankly. In the long run, I, I'm the optimist uh, today in a, many, in a big way there. And again, uh, Scott correctly pointed out that crop insurance resets its price every year, but it does so relative to the price that is negatively correlated with the amount you consume or produced. So we get really low prices when we produce a lot. And we get higher prices when we don't produce much. And so everybody wants a drought except in their own backyard. And you know, 2012 was great for farm incomes, even though we had really low yields, because it set the price high, and that price took a while to taper back down. And the APH effect takes a while to come back up. And so that offsets, there's something there that is very slow moving. But what's really important is that what's slow moving is relative to a really high base now. We cover virtually all the commercially important acreage with crop insurance. The crop insurance program is not going away. I personally wish that the commodity title had $1 more score in the CBO than crop insurance, so people wouldn't keep you know, criticizing it. But it's a very important feature, and it's really important for investors who want to own farmland but not necessarily farm it. It gives them some stability against what can be captured for cash rent going forward through time. Uh, that's um, kind of the, the stuff in the past and projected forward a little bit. The next slide is just some things I think are really critical to understand is how important ag tech and the changes in production technology seem to be becoming. Um, I see Leanne, hold, hold your hand up from Granular today. Uh, Granular is just one I love because I've been involved with them to use to illustrate this, but um, the, this, this graphic is meant to show how many things didn't exist 10 years ago that changed the cost of production or the amount you can produce. Uh, given the story, but it's a true one, and I think it's fun. The last time I planted on my own land, I was looking for four matching planter plates. Well, that tells you a lot. One, that we had a four-row corn planter, and two, that you, anybody else remember what planter plates were? <laughs> and we um, tended to buy rounds uh, because we could get them cheap from crows, and anybody know of crows or rounds? So. What would happen today is I would get a prescription set of genetics from somebody else, pay $300 more per bag of seed corn and plant it in a planter. I always like to ride around once a year, by the way, with uh, somebody when they're planting and in the fall when they're harvesting. And this year I rode in a, a, a planter, a brand new um, 350 horsepower case planter with the biggest uh, uh, split row, um, nicest uh, IH uh, planter I had ever seen. So I'm just astounded by this, and I'm looking at it, and looking at the RT system, and asking the guy who's actually driving, you know, some stuff about it, because we were watching the seeds drop in each planter um, tube, and he was complaining. He says, yeah, you know, we're trying to decide whether to upgrade or not, because mine isn't very accurate compared to my brother's. My GPS is only like, it's like maybe three inches off sometimes. <laughs> okay, he got the old one. Um, but. The set of things where we can actually manage it and we can get data layers about farmland. This is, these are screenshots from Granular's Acre Value. These are just a collection of tech companies from ag tech, but the number of things you can do without being um, searching for matching planter plates has really changed the productivity. And we're now beginning to look in field at things, not just variable rate applications, but other issues related to act activities and applications in field that change the ability to manage the asset. I think that's really important 
for a reason that may not be quite so obvious. If genetics come up uh, by adding two bushels of yield potential, they can charge you roughly 60% of that. What I think this allows you to do is access consumers' willingness to pay for things in a different way. I uh, was at a, a really interesting private equity conference uh, recently where the um, uh, keynote speaker was talking about their tokenization of information. I'm like, I don't really know what that means. It meant to him that you take every, every transaction that happens. So I know that in a grocery store, if all the stems are up in a box of strawberries, the consumer will pay more for it. And I can use that information to immediately decide in the field whether I should invest in the extra time it takes to put all the stems up. You can make those decisions that connect the consumer's willingness to pay for something all the way to something that happens at the production level. And I think that is, again, that's a little pie in the sky and it's a little out there and it's a little high techy, but I think that is actually coming faster than you might um, otherwise expect. Anyhow, that's my um, expectation. Uh, my set of expectations, and I'll end by asking you about the same set of questions again. So a lot of the things that are causing what we see as headwinds and recent changes can be thought of as at least semi-short run or driven by events that have, you know, five to ten year cycles or maybe 30 year cycles in the case of prices. And interest rates are rising, but farmland has also got a long history of being positively correlated with inflation. Returns are positively correlated with inflation. So to the extent um, interest rates increase because of inflation, I'm not scared of that. If they increase because of productivity uh, pressures, I do worry about that. Tailwinds, though, largely global demand for calorie, um, structural changes in ag production, and then the last one. Only about 1% of farmland turns over per year at arm's length. So I ask everybody if they want to buy more land, if they wanted to sell land, if you were happy as a lender, happy as a landowner, the last question is, what asset would you rather own? That makes it very, uh, that helps explain some of the support under the market prices recently.